Great. So shall we start with Mr. Eltheriadis? And then he can give us a little bit of his insight and uh, his experience on, on how enterprises and entrepreneurs can approach fundraising and pitching. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have prepared a few slides, so I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Um, and so for those that don't know me, uh, I'm a partner at Big Pie Ventures, which is a is a venture capital fund focusing on deep tech in Greece and in, in Luxembourg. Um, it's a 45 million uh, euro fund, which is now, I guess, in its uh, uh, in a fairly mature stage in the sense. cannot hear you, Mr. Alfariadis. You heard nothing so far? We heard a little bit about the big pie part. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know why. Okay, I have a message that people are waiting in the lobby, by the way. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I was saying that big pie uh, is, a, is a venture capital fund based in Greece and Luxembourg focusing on deep tech. Um, but in the talk today, I just want—I don't want to talk about the fund itself, but in general about fundraising and and pitching. And there are three things I want to emphasize. The first is that you have to understand who you are talking to when you are doing fundraising and pitching. Okay. And I took some slides from a presentation I do to universities about venture capital in general. So one thing to note about venture capital is that the focus is on the exit. OK, so the venture capital will take equity in the company, help the company grow. But ultimately, the goal of the investor is the exit. So you as a presenter, right, you have to focus on that because that is the ultimate goal of the people who will give you the money. OK, it's not just to get the company funded. It's not just to build the product, right? The goal for the VC is to see the company grow and then either be sold or do an IPO or whatever. But eventually, the, the, the investment needs to produce a return. Now, there are def different stages that the company can be at. I presume everybody here is probably in the very early stages. But again, that's a very important parameter to take into account. In other words, whether or not the, the venture capitalist or the investor you are talking to, right, is operating in the space and the stage that you are currently at. So you need to know that. Um, the third is that you need to know a little bit more about the specific VC that you are talking to. In other words, the VC does not just provide capital, but you know, through the, the partner's experience, uh, they bring in experience in management, you know, connections for business development, um, access to follow on capital, and so on. So, so uh, the expectation is that you will have done your homework to understand what are the strengths of the particular VC you are talking to, right? Because that also shows that that's how you will approach any other sort of engagement with a third party. Okay, so being prepared and having done your homework goes a very long way, okay? And finally, uh, VCs have like a, a specific sweet spot in terms of investments. For example, Big Pie typically invests, you know, from half a million to one and a half as a first investment and falling on up to five, you know, up to five million, okay? So if you come with a request for 10 million, that's definitely out of the scope of the fund, right? If you come in for 100,000 euros, that's also probably outside the scope of the fund. So by, by utilizing publicly available information or talking to friends, et cetera, you can narrow down you know, the VCs that basically are in the sweet spot for the stage of development you're at, okay? So that's that's point number one. Point number two is, is that you need to understand your own product math. And I, I'm using this as a simple way to, to depict uh, the point I, I want to make. So. So you're, you're creating a product or a service that has some value, right? Increasing value, in fact, and also has some increasing cost, all right? And you can put this in a table. And, you know, for one combination will be that I provide less value for higher cost. Obviously, that's not a product that you want to sell, okay? That's not going to fly, okay? Uh, the most typical situation where is where for some additional cost, right, you provide additional features, okay? So uh, that's very typical, but it's, it's a slightly difficult to sell to customers. Why? Because you need to convince them that the extra feature that they are offering, right, is worth the extra cost. Okay. So uh, so that's always harder because you have to make sure that this ratio is very large, so that people will be willing to pay the extra money, right, to get those extra features. Okay. And why is it significant? Because the, the harder this is, the more expensive it will be for you to sell. Okay. 
there is a similar situation where in fact you're providing less value, right? So the delta value is negative, but also the cost is negative. Now, if the cost reduction is huge, let's say I'm gonna give you half the features for one hundredth of the cost. That's actually a compelling proposition. It can be a compelling proposition, right? So it should not be ignored. But again, this ratio should be very large to make it easy for you to sell. Okay. If not, you'll have a hard time. Okay. This translates to, you know, cost of sales, marketing costs, etc. The, the the place where you definitely want to be ideally is where you provide more features for a lower cost. Right. So you go you walk in into a in, into an existing market with uh, with a established product and you can provide a better product that's cheaper. That's the ideal scenario. Okay. So you need to figure out where you are in this sort of table because it will have implications on a your ability to convince the investor and most importantly your ability to convince the customer. Okay. And the harder it is to convince, the more you need to spend to carry the message forward. Okay. So that's I think the the, 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 the founders and the presenters, if you were to repeat, need to have clarity on, on, on these issues. OK, now. For anybody who's going to pitch, you know, you can go and Google, you know, how to create a pitch deck, etc. What areas to focus on? I put like, you know, six uh, items here and I guess we will discuss them later on about the team, the market, product quality, etc. These are all, again, very well known. OK, uh, features uh, in, in the end of the day. One should not forget that that when you go to present, you need to tell a story and you need to convince about how passionate you are and how convinced you are about the product you're building. Ultimately, it will boil down to these elements, however, when people look at this in detail. And I'm sure we'll discuss it in more detail uh, and so on. The final thing I wanted to show is a little bit the choreography. What you should expect as a as a pro, as a potential um, uh, as an entrepreneur from the from the interaction you have in the in the fundraising sort of dance. So initially you come in with a pitch deck that you'll present to, to one or more partners, you know, 10, 20 slides um, that you describe everything you, you know about the business, including summary financials. So like, okay? you should definitely say what you are asking for in terms of money and what stage will get you to. And typically after a successful first meeting and speaking, I guess, for Big Pie, typically you, you will want to go deeper in terms of financials. So the business model, Excel, uh, uh, as well as the use of funds. How are you going to spend the money you are asking? The business model is important, not so much about the numbers, but more about the mechanics of the business. How is the business going to make money? So the model you are you are capturing on the Excel sheet is more important in some ways than the actual numbers that are in the model, because the parameters can be tuned as you know more about the market, about your product, right? So you can fine tune it. But the, the basic structure of how the Excel is organized is your company. You cannot easily change that. In other words, how you make money. So after a number of iterations in these discussions, okay, then they typically the, the, the VC will have an investment committee that will decide whether or not they will invest. If they decide to invest, you get a term sheet, right, which will have terms about the amount, how much the, your company is going to be valued, which will translate to what percentage the investor is going to take, right, and additional terms related to the investment. Okay, one of the partners typically will become a board member. Okay, uh, and then it, you know. After this, the term sheet is signed, within a matter of weeks or a, or a month or so, you'll get the definitive uh, agreements that you sign and you'll get the money. Okay, and the process from beginning to end could take anywhere from one to three months. Okay, um, I guess different funds have different sort of uh, parameters. And of course, I, I should point out that even though from an entrepreneur's point of view, getting the money is success, it is just the very beginning of a very, 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 very long journey. Okay, so so it is a time to sort of pause and be happy about it. But again, it's just the beginning of a very long journey. OK, uh, that's it for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, Mr. Lefariadis, thank you a lot. Shall we hear Mr. Musmula's opinion on that or like what is his input and his advice that you would like to share for now? We cannot hear you, Mr. Musmula, as you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Loud and clear. Thanks. Let me share my screen. All right. So I'm happy, Alex, that you uh, uh, let's say you you covered the basics. Uh, so I'm actually going to go into some more let's say details of the process or some uh, sort of small things that um, most 
people or many people usually don't pay a lot of attention to. So I have just two slides. One is on the general uh, fundraising process and one is on the specifically on pitching. Um, so the first one is, I, I think Alex covered that. So again, it's very important to not waste investors' time. Investors are very, very busy. Usually VCs are very, very busy because there are not that many of us that are doing this job across Europe. It's probably around, I'd say, 200, 250 active funds across the whole of Europe. So we are very busy, typically. Uh, and, and so investors like people who have done their homework and, and they have targeted, you know, their focuses and areas of interest. And, you know, and this can be anything from, uh, uh, you know, the technologies, sectors, uh, it could be, uh, you know, looking at the funds portfolio, it could be at the stage and the ticket size that they typically invest in, um, you know, it could be all this sort of stuff. Instead of, you know, if someone is doing, you know, has never done logistics and they're doing, I don't know, marketplaces or whatever, and you pitch them a logistics startup, they're not going to be very happy. Um, the second thing is, uh, this is a very major point, I think, uh, that a lot of startup founders um, have not heard about or do not fully realize. Uh, it is important that you realize, uh, especially in the early stages where angels are also a source of potential investment, uh, it is very important that you realize the practical differences between angels and funds. Uh, angels are, you know, they invest typically, you know, in anywhere from one to three, sometimes even more, but typically very low figure uh, of startups per year or over a number of years. Uh, and generally, you know, they don't do, do this as a full-time job. Um, they're investing their own money. So typically they would be happy with smaller let's say returns in the area of, you know, two times, three times, four times their money. This is perfectly fine for an angel. Of course, if they make 10 or a hundred times, it's even better, but it's not very, it's not really critical for them. Uh, in contrast, funds, uh, the way the funds are structured is typically, you know, if you look at fund returns, they're very skewed. So the majority of the portfolio is not going to go well, or at best is going to return the money. And most, you know, the fund is going to be returned. Most returns are going to come out of one, two, three investments, you know, very, very small number. So in order for a fund to be interested in investing something, it has to have the potential of exponential return. Exponential means 10 times, 20 times, even more. So that is why sometimes an otherwise very valid and interesting business idea or technology does not necessarily attract the appropriate attention because the fund does not see the large potential for return there. Uh, more conservative investors like angels or more traditional investors might be more appropriate in this, in this case. And then as a segue to that, it has, you have to ask yourself, if you are addressing a fund, you have to ask the, 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 yourself the, the critical questions that the fund is going to ask. Initially, uh, you know, up to about, let's say a couple of years ago, it was only or primarily this question here. Is it the billion dollar market? This was, you know, like the lollipop that you, you heard around, you know, investing circles the whole time. Now, this has been supplemented in the last couple of years. Is it on top of a billion dollar market? Is it a hundred million dollar company? In other words, is it reasonable to expect within a finite amount of time or years that you reach a hundred million revenues? Does it have this potential? Or you are going to plateau at max, you know, 5 million, 10 million or whatever. And the third point there is that, um, you know, it is not just, you know, many, many investors, especially in a bit later rounds, you know, they ask for 1 million ARR or half million ARR or whatever, but it is not just that because it's sort of a triangle of KPIs that they look at. It's not just the absolute number. It is the growth trajectory that you have there. In other words, if you are at half a million ARR and you have 20, percent growth month on month, that is perfectly fine uh, because someone, you know, they're looking, they're looking at the 1 million target and they see it's, it's reasonable to be attained within the next few months. And then it's also a matter of margins because if it's a low margin business, you know, even if you have a high ARR or MRR, it's still going to be less attractive for them. So you have to really pay attention to those three KPIs. Uh, the next point is that, again, there are graduations in the interest of investors, depending on whether this has pure financial value for them or it has strategic value. So uh, very often you see corporates 
being interested in rounds and you know blowing up the valuation because it has some synergy with them um, either in technology or in customers or whatever and therefore this increases the value they're willing to pay in terms of valuation in terms of interest um, pure financial investors this is less so the case right if you see you know it's looking objectively at each investment um, and the last point obviously of course as you've heard before um, warm interests are better than cold emailing or cold messaging, but still, if you have no other option and you want to pursue someone, I would still try it. Okay, I mean, I would still do my best to find a warm intro, but again, you know, if this is your only option, you, I, would, I would still do it. And then the other thing, if we go to, to specifically to pitching tips, uh, you know, again, these are perhaps small details, but uh, they're important, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the small details that make a difference. So the first thing is you have to realize, again, and again, I'm being very brutally and, and perfectly honest there, that most investors, and again, because they are very busy, their attention span is very short. So depending on what the format of the presentation is, whether it's a short pitching of you know five minutes or whether it's like a full session of half an hour to an hour, uh, you know their attention span may be anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple minutes. Uh, and there are several studies that have shown that actually most investors, you know, uh, are are sold on something on an idea on a concept on a startup within you know a, a few minutes, you know, a couple of minutes usually. You know, you know that this is right, and then okay. You know the rest of course you know you you do your your research your due diligence your evaluation but you know it is it, it does it is very very important to make a, a very good impression in the beginning and, and that is why the second point is important you have to put your strengths and major achievements first what i mean by that is you know if for example you're a marketplace and you have half a million arr right you're going to put that first you're not going to put you know your technology or your uh your team or whatever, unless it's exceptional, you're going to put first, you know, whatever is going to attract the most attention first. Um, if, you know, on the contrary, you have no traction, but you have a very strong team with a prior track record or whatever, you're going to put that as your as your first slide. Uh, so you have to adapt and, and, and show your best self first. That is really important. Uh, in terms of length, I would aim at approximately 15 minutes and you know, up to 15 slides so that it does not exceed 20 minutes under any circumstances. And then, you know, there is sufficient time, you know, up to 30 to 40 minutes of discussion and questions and clarifications. That is, you know, assuming that you have a you know reasonable product that is not overly complex. If you have some really sort of deep technology, then you need to spend a bit more time on that. But again, I try to stick to those numbers as much as I could. Um, the next point is you have to cover all bases, right? So you have to answer all the points that an investor is looking at, which is a problem that you're solving. It is how you're solving it, the very good product description so that the investor really understands what you're doing, which is not always obvious. You very often come out of, you know, the 20 or 30 minute presentation. I have to ask, so what is it actually that you're doing and how are you doing? And then we spend another 15 minutes on that. Uh, the market size, the differentiation, the competition, uh, your team, and obviously how you're going to make money. So the more of those, you know, potential questions from the investor you're going to cover within 15 minutes, the better. Uh, then the particularly for early stage, which I assume is where you know this mostly applies uh, to the audience right now. Um, we very often, again, see very long financial projections over three years, four years, five years. Every reasonable investor knows that, you know, this is basically up in the air. So uh, for me personally, the use of funds, you know, to show me a reasonable use of funds and what you plan to do with the investment is actually at this stage, at the very early stage, probably makes more sense than seeing like a five-year projection. If you do at later stages of the of the contact with the investor, if you do send projections and excels and whatever, uh, again, typically what the, a serious investor was, wants to see more is your assumptions, the underlying assumptions, rather than the actual numbers. Uh, so show the assumptions very clearly. What are you assuming? And the last point is, again, this is something that a lot of American investors have been complaining about and European founders, that there is a lack of ambition and passion or whatever. 
I'm not saying that you should go in the exact opposite direction. Um, and, and clearly, you know, some of the pitches you see from American founders are over the top, so you don't need to do that, but at least try to show an adequate level of energy and passion, because that is, you know, what you will ultimately be judged on, particularly, again, in the early stages where there is very little data and numbers to go by. So I hope that wasn't too much, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mosmulas. I think it was on point and it's probably very useful for our participants. And now we can hear the, um, the position of Ms. Trahana, if you would like to add something or if you want to give us your insight. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dora Trahana, I'm principal uh, at Unifund VC, and uh, I will try more of the same, but built on what was already said by um, Alex and George. So given that Alex made a first introduction on how a VC uh, works and George uh, moved that uh, a step forward into what we expect, let, let's say, and what you should take into consideration when approaching a VC, uh, I'll try to give some tips on how you could uh, organize uh, your pitching presentation and uh, what we expect uh, to find there and what questions should be asked uh, on a first stage and so on. So I try to um, share my screen. So give me a minute. Just let me know if you can see. So uh, I'll be fast. Uh, I'll be fast. So, uh, apart from, of course, uh, at, at first stage, uh, as George mentioned, we would like to see uh, your advancements. We would like to be able to uh, have a first overview of who you are and what you have achieved so far. So, this is a very important part uh, that you should not skip. For example, if you have a previous, um, let's say, um, um, uh, involvement in another startup of if you have been a, a corporate or an executive in the field that you are now trying to uh, apologies that you are now trying to reach out to us with an idea this is something that should be mentioned from the the very beginning as George mentioned but uh, when you do that, uh, it's the point that uh, we move on to the problem. So uh, it's OK. Hello, I'm Dora. I'm coming from the VC world and I found out, given that I am, for example, five years uh, in this sector and I've, um, let's say, um, now I'm trying to pitch out. Uh, I'm five years in this sector. I every day um, see and evaluate many, many startups and I uh, I've found, uh, I have found myself a very specific problem that I want to uh, propose a solution for. So here you go from the problem and there you have to express um, which problem you're trying to solve and uh, what uh, user needs you have identified, of course, and uh, we, which areas you are trying to uh, target when uh, proposing a solution into this problem. And after uh, getting this problem um, uh, very, very clear to our minds, then you uh, get into the solution part. So you have to uh, describe the solution, so how this works, how this is going to solve the problem that you are actually trying to solve, and of course provide us some use cases in order to be able to understand what uh, this is going to, um, to solve exactly, so which uh, user needs this is going to cover, and of course which aspects of the user needs um, are better or ideally or differently covered by your proposed solution. Uh, of course, at this stage, we do not uh, need to know much uh, of uh, technical specifications and many details, uh, but we would like to understand what you're doing and why you're doing this better or differently uh, related to the others that are already in the market or, or are working uh, in this market. Uh, getting into the market, of course, as George mentioned, we want to see a big market. So we want to uh, be able to see some markets of billions, be able to understand that you are going to build something huge in order to have returns. And we are planning towards our own exit. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yeah. We just missed the last sentence. It wasn't very clear. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm repeating. 
So given that uh, a VC has a specific way of work and we are working towards uh, the exit scenario, as Alex mentioned in the very beginning, uh, we would like to understand the market size that you are going to address apart from the problem and the solution that you're uh, suggesting. We would like to uh, get to know the market numbers and we would like to be able to understand how this is going to become a billion or a million or many millions actually uh, company. Uh, of course, we, uh, when, when we are able to um, listen to your pitch and when we are going to evaluate your idea, we are going to start thinking towards our own exit scenario. So this is where the market comes. So it's very, very important to be able to uh, calculate the market sizes if this is not something that it's clear enough and most of the times this is not crystal clear so you have to, to get into calculations or make some assumptions or uh, uh, try to find some industry uh, citations and researches in order to make this uh, clear to us. And apart from that, it's the stage where you have to say to us why you're different. So which is your competitive advantage, which uh, your competitors are, and mention the, the main similarities and differences that you have from them. Maybe a graph uh, would help, or for example, a table stating each of, uh, of the um, competitive ideas, yours and the rest, of course and uh, also writing down the main uh, characteristics of your product related to the main characteristics of the product of the main competitors that you have. Um, a point that I would like to mention here is that it's quite often to uh, meet people that are doing something quite unique, but this is not um, meaning that you don't have a competition. You may have competitors that are not direct or are not offering the, the very core, the very same core value that you're offering, but uh, they may be indirect competitors or at least they may be compete uh, the, the stake, let's say, or the money out of the pocket of, of uh, your main customers. These are also competitors. So please try to, to be clear because it's quite often to see uh, people saying, I don't have any competition. And yes, you may not have such of a competition very, very directly, but indirect competition also counts. Um, one of the last points that we would like, of course, to see is the revenue model, and we don't mean uh, so much of financials or, um, and, um, let's say, for pre-seed uh, especially deals. This was also mentioned before. We don't want to see a 10-year pro projection model because in most of the cases, in six months from now, this will not have any value. So we would like to see how you're going to do this. Uh, take into account the main assumptions that you have done in your model. And of course, uh, be able to describe the main revenue streams or the revenue sources that you are going to use in order basically to understand the business model behind the numbers and not the numbers that uh, keep the, the revenue uh, and the business model um, at, uh, behind, let's say. And of course, um, towards the end, we would like to understand where you stand at the moment and which the next steps are. And by next steps, of course, we mean the use of funds. So you're asking for uh, for investment. What's, what's the, the reason why you do that? Why are you, are you asking for an investment? And of course, uh, where you are going to be in six months from now, in 12 months from now, in 18 months from now, uh, so uh, which is the use of resources that you are going to do. And last but not least, of course, uh, we would like to see the team, see the complementarities uh, among the, the team members, uh, have clear roles in our mind, and of course, be able to understand why you and not anyone else out of, of your competitors. So uh, that's most from my side. Great. Thank you so much. And Thank you. We'll hear the input from Mr. Nicolaidis as well. And then we can move on with some questions from, from all the participants and just a panel discussion. Um, absolutely. Thank you very much. Just give me one second, please. So, um, Velocity Partners is, so by the way, I'm Konstantinos Nikolaidis, a senior analyst at Velocity Partners. Uh, Velocity Partners is the smallest of the Equifund funds that started off 
a couple of years ago here in Greece with assets under management of 24 million and focusing on early stage investments at pre-seed and seed stage. Uh, usually we invest in companies that may be uh, at ideation stage or uh, prototype stage or MVP stage with an average ticket size of 300 to 500,000 where we like to be the first institutional investor that comes in uh, on a company's round. So uh, my colleagues before, of course, touched some very important points. I will try to also keep it brief since you may notice that some things overlap. Uh, VCs think alike and they do want to see basically the same things over and over when it comes to uh, a deck and how companies presented. So um, for the founder's perspective, they may, they have to make sure that they do the homework. They have to make sure that they know about the VC they're about to talk to. So this means uh, know everything about the fund size, what the year it is in terms of when the fund size started. So, you know, many funds that may have started a couple of years ago may not be in a position to invest uh, as they reach the end of their investment period. So it is important for a founder to know the VC's history, where they are at uh, at this stage in time, and basically whether they invest in uh, the industry that they operate in. Uh, this, of course, can be found by looking at uh, a VC's portfolio, see how the VC has positioned itself uh, when it comes to investments and in which markets. So you will get some very, very good insights about basically the VC's appetite, what makes them tick. Uh, you can also, of course, make go deeper in your research and just reach out to founders that uh, have received investment from such said VC uh, to get feedback and to basically form your strategy um, when to make sure you're ready uh, to talk to this VC and present your idea. So when you make sure that the VC is indeed in a stage where they are actively investing, if you're sure that the, v the, that the VC does invest in the industry that you operate in, and uh, if you, have, of course, have made the right reference calls to make sure you're ready to talk to the responsible person in that VC, then, of course, you reach out to them, um, you send out a deck. Maybe, of course, it's better a warm intro if you have one. Makes the whole process very easier, as uh, my colleagues noted before. <clears throat> so the VCs tend to look at some very specific things when it comes to evaluating a, an investment proposal. Uh, first and foremost, uh, they have to see that the, the company, the startup that they're looking at, the proposition, does solve a real problem, a real problem that's out there, uh, where there are customers that are in need uh, to solve that problem. Of course, uh, they want to see also that the, there is a clear solution when it comes to that problem, uh, a clear explanation of, as to how this problem will be solved by this startup or this proposition. Timing is also very important uh, by showing the VC, of course, that you know this is the right time to invest because, uh, for example, solution picking up on such a product has becoming more and more wide widespread, and of course there is a lot of room to grow moving forward. Timing is very important, so you can convince the VC to the city basically about the urgency of investing uh, at this time so uh, you know do not they do not miss the train and you have of course to explain that um, with uh, specific terms meaning that you have to show evidence about why this timing is right uh, of course VCs are also extremely interested in uh, knowing about the team and seeing a strong and resilient team that can deliver this is absolutely important and of course for early stage VCs that you know that there is not much to look at in terms of uh, revenues, maybe sometimes even product. There has to be there a team that will be able to convince the VC that they are the ones that will be able to execute this idea or they are the ones that they will take this product to the next level. So yes, the team is uh, at least for very, very early stage VCs and I think for all VCs, uh, number one priority when they look at uh, a proposition. Um, of course, the value the value solution creates uh, comes and builds uh, as to what Mr. Eleftheriadis said before, so we'll not clearly expand on this, but of course it's something that you have to show how uh, a current business model will be changed by your proposition, how you will add value, how you will capture the uncaptured value of uh, how things are done right now. 
<clears throat> having a scale-up plan is also very important. Uh, a VC w wants to an exit, as my predecessor said, of course. Um, and f to have a successful exit, you also need beforehand to have a plan to scale up, to make sure that your company expands, to make sure that you capture as much of the market share as possible. And you have to showcase that to, to a VC. And this is what a VC actually looks at. Uh, it was one of the most important things that they look at. Uh, your plan to grow the company. And of course, the exit that we discussed, all VCs want to see returns. If you're aiming to build a company that, uh, you know, you, you want to leave that your grandkids to also continue, etc., etc., this may not work. Um, and an exit, whether through IPO or through private acquisition, is VC and should be when they talk to the VC and when they start a company that, we, that, that they wish to become VC fundable. Now, how does this all translate? I'm oh, sorry, we also have uh, the financial projection, of course, that we also mentioned. Uh, as we said, of course, nobody expects this to, to be true in uh, two, three, five years from now. Uh, the VC does not, uh, will not hold the, these numbers against you in three or five years' time if they invest in you, of course. It's mainly to, for the VC to see how the founders think. Uh, what are the, their assumption are, the assumptions are, uh, how they're looking to spend the money that they're going to raise. So it's an, a very good exercise that shows the thinking of the founders, and it's very important for the VC. Now, how does this all translate uh, in a pitch deck? Uh, pitch deck should be very short. It has been found that VCs usually spend three or four minutes uh, reading a VC, even less. So the purpose of a deck should be to move the needle for the VC just enough so they can have a follow up with you, so they can uh, request more information and move on the discussion. So it should be short, it should be to the point, and it should showcase all these important things that we just described. So the problem could, be, could very, very well be one slide in your, uh, in, in your deck simply very clearly describing the problem that exists now. Even if you're in the most complicated, uh, offering the most complicated technical solution, you can still uh, describe the problem uh, very easily and your solution, of course, which should also be limited to one slide. If you can fit those in uh, both the problem and the solution in one slide as well, that's also fine. Also very, very important to include a roadmap, uh, a nice infographic showing to the reader about how, where you're at right now, how you have reached this point and where you're going to in the future with quite some simple steps so that it becomes easily readable and uh, very easy to understand for the reader. Market and competition, um, Dora described it before, of course, you should also definitely have it uh, in your deck, one slide minimum. Uh, your team, as we said before, one of the most important, uh, if not the most important aspect when uh, it comes to uh, evaluating a proposal. Uh, your team should be complementary. Uh, VCs usually do not like solo founders uh, because it's much better to have two or three founders that you know you are going to be together and are going to face all the difficulties moving forward. There are a lot of difficulties while building a startup from the ground up. And it's always good to know that there is someone next to you that is, has also skin in the game and is willing to help and has the same vision as you. And of course, it all comes down to skills. Uh, a CEO may, may have good executive skills, management skills, selling skills. A CTO will be good at you know, adding a team of people and so on and so forth. So make sure you showcase your skills, you showcase your abilities, your experience and uh, highlight why you are the ones that will be able to execute this idea. The financial projections, as we said, could also uh, you could also include it in the uh, in the slides. It's going to be more simple than that, uh, because as we said, VCs will not hold you against that these numbers, these uh, precise numbers. They want to see how you're looking to spend the money you're, that you're going to raise, and they want to see the assumptions that you make uh, as regards the future. And of course, if you happen to have this conversation and you present live your deck to the to the VCs, even if they are negative towards the idea of investing in your company, you can make sure that you engage in some Q&A, uh, get feedback because this feedback is free. You have that VC on the call uh, or in a meeting room. So why not use the, this opportunity to gather as much uh, free feedback as possible with precise questions. So when you come and talk to the next investor, you're even more prepared. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you all. And now I think we need to, to give the stage to the participants. 
and uh, you can you can just shoot our our VCs that we have here now with any questions that you have regarding the pitching or the fundraising or whatever you think that they can help you out with. Do you have any specific questions? You can either send it on the on the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. Otherwise, I have some that I can ask. Yeah, we can see that Andreas is raising a hand. Yeah, hello. This Hi. is Andreas Malakis from b Board. And um, thank you very much for all the information. I wanted to ask about the involvement after the fundraising is complete. What about uh, the involvement in increasing leads or strategic planning? Uh, can we expect help from uh, from the VCs in these sectors? If I may, yeah, if I may chime in. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, look, the the an institutional VC will normally, especially if it's the first investor, will, will certainly have a, a position in the board of directors of the company. And as a result, <clears throat> it will help the founders, you know, uh, essentially create structure within the company. Uh, for a lot of founders, they either do not have significant experience in large organizations or sometimes they do, but not across different functions. So you may have worked, let's say, for Google for seven years, right? But this doesn't mean you have seen all the different functions that Google has in terms of the, the, the various sort of operations in the company. So, so the, the board of directors and as a result, the, the investors, you know, have a very instrumental role in helping you go through this process of putting structure, okay? Making sure you institute, you know, good practices, uh, you, you, you know, you, that you, you have a plan that you execute upon. So, so there is a continuous, I guess, interaction, certainly like at a monthly level, let's say, in a, in a more mature company, but in the beginning stages, it's certainly, you know, more direct on that. And that's why it's also important to, to pick, you know, when you look for investors, pick those that, you know, you feel that you can, interact with in, a, in an effective way and they can help you in, uh, you know, in your sort of growth path. Thank you. And um, uh, if I may, I have also a second question. Uh, what could you suggest uh, would be the best point for a company to, to reach out for money, taking into consideration that uh, there may be not a, an immediate requirement for, uh, for cash flow, uh, I take it that uh, the later, uh, the better, isn't it? If, if I may, I guess the answer is yes. Remember, whenever you ask for, for investment, you give away equity, right? So, so by delaying, the argument is that you'll have uh, minimized or reduced, let's say, the investment risk, and hopefully you'll have to give away less equity. But remember, the reason why you get investment is because you need the cash to grow and grow fast. That's the only reason why getting, you know, that it makes sense to, to, to raise you know, a lot of money quickly, right? So, so there's a trade-off between, you know, should I wait and how long versus, okay, maybe I should go quickly because, you know, I have the idea, I'm ready to go out, I need the money now. So this, there is certainly a trade-off. Okay, but there are distinct phases, I guess, in the in the evolution of the company, where if you are close to an important milestone, for example, you are just about to make a sale, your first sale as a company, right? I would argue it's it's probably good if you can wait a little bit longer to have some sales traction before you initiate an investment discussion. Why? Because it gives you a much better negotiating position in terms of having eliminated, you know, one potential investment risk, right? But if you are too far away, right, and you need the money to build the product, and you cannot pay software developers or whatever to, to, to go forward, then I would say, no, it doesn't make sense to, to wait at all. I would go immediately and, and get money. If I may add something to this, it, it, for me, there is no very clear answer there. It all depends on the plans that you're going to present, uh, the plans you're going to have and going to present. If you present, you know, a, a, a plan where you're, going to be running like you say in bolt that's different than you know if you're running a marathon so if you really want to go fast then there's and you can justify what you're going to 
use the money for. That's why I stressed the use of funds earlier in the slides. Uh, it's acceptable nowadays. It's acceptable because nowadays there's quite a bit of money in the, mar in the market. Uh, at times when money is more is more scarce, then yeah, you have to be more cautious. Thank you. Okay. It is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very clear if you are involved in a project where uh, you need the money in order to progress, if, if you need assets or if you need the technology to do it, but it's very complicated and strategically not clear if uh, exactly what you said, uh, should I run a marathon or should I run, uh, as you say, in bold? To, to do 100 meters, I will need the money. And uh, it might be the case that uh, this money will also pay off. But I can also do it slower. But then again, you, you, you run the risk that maybe the competition will, uh, will catch you. So typically, typically for VC investors, faster is better. So you should not be afraid to spend the money. There are founders who are very frugal with their money and make uh, you know, a few hundred thousand last three years or four years. This is not what an ABC investment is about. So unless if you have very long development cycles because you're developing a very complex and tech heavy product, then faster is better. Okay. okay. We can move on with some questions that we have on the chat. The first one is from Mr. Karayanis and he's wondering what are the usual deliverables a VC asks from someone when they are funding them? Do they only take a percentage of the company and that's all? Do they take a share during company's decision? Do they want any specific deadlines? I guess like his question is, what is the involvement a little bit similar to the, the one before? Um, if I may, uh, well, when we, we get into an investment, of course, uh, we take a percentage, of, as you mentioned, it may be uh, two or 20 percent, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, at that point, typically, when, when it's a pre-seed investment, it's closely to 20% than to two, just to, uh, if it's a pre-seed, actually. And of course, uh, we want the chair at the board, if there is a board, it's typical, I mean board, or if it's not, it's something similar to that. And of course, um, when it is a pre-seed investment, I mean, so when it's early, early enough, uh, the VC um, typically is quite hands-on. So we used to have um, a certain involvement in the company. So for significant um, uh, business decisions, for example, we don't have deadlines, meaning deadlines. The, the deadlines that we have are mainly related to the reporting and the monitoring of the company. So uh, we have a monthly reporting on the main KPIs, including revenues, expenses, and of course, business KPIs that we have uh, set up together with the founders. And this has, of course, uh, to take place on at least a monthly basis. But apart from that, we used to have uh, uh, weekly or bi-weekly or monthly calls. It depends on the case of the business, but uh, they are very uh, usual and uh, quite often. And uh, we used to, uh, as I mentioned, take part in the, the sufficient, of course, and the uh, significant business decisions, including uh, the strategy, of course, the new product development, uh, key hires, and so on. So that's what we do typically. If I may, if I may add, I think there's a, a little bit of misconception, maybe judging from the from the question. Look, the company makes a strategic plan in terms of what it will do, let's say, for the next 12 months in terms of hiring, product development, you know, go to market, customers, etc. That is created by the management team with the help of the, of the board. OK, so so the, the role of the board, in other words, is to help create that plan and then monitor its execution. OK, so it's not like a, it's not like school where, you know, you have to do this by Monday. I need this report by Tuesday or like right? so. So it's like a good parent, right? You, you want the child the company right to excel in what it is that it's doing. So that's a continuous let's say, process. And there is a lot of how should I say, mentoring or oversight uh, in, in the sense that you want the company to grow, the executive team to grow again in the in the in the newfound roles, because again, for many people, this will be the first time they'll be sitting on those on those seats. So it's still more nuanced than just, oh, there is a deadline or I have this deliverable, etc. OK, um, just to be clear. At least in a, in, a, in a good and productive relationship where things are going well and everybody's doing what they should be doing. Okay. 
Great. And then another question is that in case uh, someone is requesting funding and the main reason for that is for investment or sorry for advertising, uh, is this considered an appropriate use of funds obtained from a VC? Uh, if, if, if I can comment on that, I think yeah. we have seen it before and it's usually not. Uh, the VC does not like to see its money go straight to Facebook or Google for uh, any of that reasons. Of course, uh, advertising is important if you're building a, a product or, or have a service that relies on advertising, but uh, the, the answer, the most simple answer to this is no. Uh, uh, funds are usually sp well spent when growing the team internally, when uh, spending on the product, etc, etc. Uh, advertising uh, sh should be a concern later on when you have, of course, a, a, a product in the market um, and you want to expand in this way. But uh, no, I don't think it should be uh, an acceptable way to spend the money. Just advertising, of course. Okay. Look, these kinds of questions, again, is like, should I have a sandwich? It's a different question when I'm actually on my way to Thessaloniki. If I'm on the way to Thessaloniki, yes, the answer is should have a sandwich because it's a long way and I need to eat something, right? But without the context, you know, I, you cannot even answer the question, right? So there's got to be a plan of how the company will make money, be successful, right? So that, remember, you'll reach the exit, right? The company will reach a point where it can be sold. So, so I agree that in general, you know, without any context, yeah, I mean, you, you wouldn't invest in a company just to spend on advertising. Having said that, it could be a significant cost uh, center, right? If it matches, you know, the corresponding business model and overall strategy for a particular company, okay? Okay. And then another question is, um, if a startup or the, the enterprise should use brokers or any type of intermediaries to look for VCs? Or should they just try it on their own? On their own. In general, in general, for most, you know, most VCs I know of, they would frown upon using a broker. And for several reasons, by the way, uh, look, a, a big job of the, the executive team is to do fundraising, and they will do this not just once, they will do it all the time. So you, you got to be able to do this in a convincing and an effective way. So the sooner you start, the better. So by hiring a broker, you know, you don't show that you can actually do that, right? Plus, you know, they'll take a commission fee. So this and hiring, meaning convincing people to join your company, is something that the founding team needs to do all the time, never stops. So I would say, set, you know, no brokers at all. I think we should make a distinction between a formal broker that does this as a business, okay, which is more appropriate to other types of financing and other types of companies like traditional uh, private equity type, you know, for traditional businesses. Uh, and uh, and VC, especially at the early stages, at the early stages is simply too early. Now, if you're raising a 10 million, 20 million round, again, you should be able to raise it on the basis of your traction as well. But and but there is a distinction between this type of people and brokers, professional brokers, and people that might make introductions to investors they know or to be to the funds they know, etc. This is different. And you know, if you have such people in the network, please do use them. But it is unlikely they're going to ask for much in return perhaps you know if they're considered an advisor they might have a very small stake or something but they would very rarely ask for a commission right yeah actually you always makes a good point that you know we're talking about early stage investments yeah absolutely if you are an operating company with several million in revenue you might hire an investment bank to help you let's say sell the company or or do some other financial transaction, raising debt or whatever. But for small companies, it will be very unusual to have somebody. And again, you might have an advisor helping out, that's perfectly fine, right? I wouldn't consider that a broker, right? Uh, that's just an intermediary, et cetera. And typically they wouldn't get a commission from the introduction, right? Um, um, versus a, a professional, let's say, will say, look, if you hire me, then I can bring you half a million, let's say, in investment. That, that would not be a, a good plan. Okay. And this is actually connected with the next question, which is a concern, I guess, um, because they, they mentioned that like two of the, the VC said that they they prefer a warm introduction. And then they say that um, if just a friend of a friend would introduce you as a good, clever guy, if that is better 
other than like uh, for, from the startup to just introduce themselves and then send you um, a message on LinkedIn or send you their pitch deck. There is, a good point. there is a good point there because yes, of course, by warm introduction, we mean someone who actually knows the person in question, at least marginally, at least it, with a distinction being that the person in question, the target is going to at least uh, to a point trust somebody's opinion. So the closer this person is, for example, like a founder in my portfolio, you know, I will give some more weight to their opinion and to their recommendation than someone I very marginally know, right? Um, so the closer you are, there's no black and white there. The, you know, the closer it is to the person in question, the better. Uh, if it is completely out of the blue, um, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's mostly because of lack of time, I would say, you know, it's mostly because of lack of time. Uh, so you, okay, I mean, it is a bit of an unfair, you know, situation, but you sort of skip the queue to a certain extent, but that's unfortunately how, how things work, and especially for later stage investors, much more than us early stage investors, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, look, maybe, yeah, I should chime in as well. The, the, there's nothing wrong about a call email or a call, call approach on LinkedIn, etc. In fact, it does work. It's not that it doesn't work. Again, there's no silver bullet. But as I was said, it just helps. What happens is it's not that VCs are very busy. Everybody's very busy. I don't know anybody who will ask them, are you busy? And say, oh, no, you know what? I had such a relaxing day at work today. Everybody's super busy. The problem is noise. Noise meaning we get so many decks, right? And most of them are actually very poor quality, okay? So the problem is that you are inundated with a, you know, the large flow of, of decks, right? And you have to figure out where should I you know, spend my attention on. So obviously you take a look at them, Right. And the problem is that that in the, in the absence let's say, of a referral, right, the probability of you uh, missing something important increases. I'm not saying it's, it's very high because, again, we are. In, that's what we do. I mean, our business is to find the diamonds sort of, you know, in the sun. Right. So we have to be very careful and not things like drop. But it's just you make your life easier by having this referral. Right. That you go past this initial very noisy environment of all these decks that are coming in and you stand out. Right. And so, for example, you know, going to the website of a VC is probably not a very good idea because that's the most noisy channel. Going through LinkedIn, much better. You know why? Because it's messaging. I'll see it in my incoming, you know, LinkedIn. I have to pay attention to it. Now, by the way, this is not an invitation for everybody to inundate my <laughs> LinkedIn with messages. But, <laughs> but I mean, you have to look at it. You know, the, the, the psychology of the person who is going to respond to that, right? And so, and by making a compelling, also, and very professional presentation, that also helps. I click, I open up a PDF. Immediately, I see, you know, the level of effort and quality you put in this effort, right? So, so you, 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 you know, you do yourself a favor by making that very compelling. Okay, um, so, you know, if this is a very, again, you know, there's is, there is a, there is a lot of things which are very technical, let's say, and quantitative, but there are also a lot of things which are more qualitative and has to do with our social interaction, right? So that's why I think, you know, people should remember, you know, you, you have a story to tell, you have a vision for a company that you will build, right? And you have to figure out how to say it in an effective way. And this starts, again, from the very first, page of your PD, of your of your deck, right? So if you think like that, I think it'll go a long way to attracting attention. If not with the first VC or the second, you know, maybe the fifth or the sixth, you know, will wake up and, and, and do it, right? So by the way, persistence is also key. Don't just give up because, you know, five people say, you know, it's a bad idea, okay? Um, Great. I think we have one more question and then we need to slowly start wrapping up. Um, so the question is that uh, what is the approximately the range of pre-investment valuation minimum and more importantly maximum for startups who are looking to invest to? Is it, sorry, is it a function of your available fund of the local environment of the sector, etc.? Um, if I can go quickly, drop an answer on this. It's it has its own strategy and its deal is unique in that sense. 
Uh, if the strategy of the VC is to acquire a majority stake in the company with a specific investment ticket, then you can work the math and see that uh, you know what percentage the the VC is looking to take, and hence you can see the valuation of the company. Uh, for early stage, where usually you don't have any revenues, uh, so you can basically base a valuation on or assets or etc. It's basically an exercise of this of how much the founder is willing to give away. What investment does the founder look to, to, to receive? Because the VC will weigh that they will also do their own research when coming to comparables in similar deals uh, in this sector, in this specific sector at this specific stage of the company. So yes, it's up to you to make uh, an informed decision and say basically that given the stage that my company is at now, I want to give this percentage out with, and uh, get this money as an investment to achieve my goals and next milestones. So all in all, the valuation is this. If, of course, I repeat, you do not have any revenues available, you're a pre-seed, seed deal. Uh, this changes, of course, when we, we talk about bigger rounds, but when it comes to to, to, to early stages, we said, with no, with no revenues, this is a simple, very simple equation that uh, you have to come up with. So, yes, have a look at the portfolio of the VC. Uh, it, of course, such information may not be written, but the VC made in the company, um, and you can also make assumptions about what percentage they, they got. Uh, and based on that, you can see the valuation. So it's for early stages, I believe it's uh, more of an art rather than science. Uh, but let me uh, let me clarify, you know, it's very important in, in these funding rounds, right, to keep everybody incentivized. So, for example, a VC would not want to take, uh, let's say, half of the company. Why? Because then the, the, the founders will lose interest in the company as the company evolves and further dilution takes place. Uh, every time you have an investment, let's say if an investor takes 20% of the company, right, the remaining pe people, right, will dilute by 0 0.8. If you do this three times, you'll end up with half of your original percentage, right? So what you want to do is make sure as you go through funding rounds that everybody sort of remains incentivized to be in the company, you know, work and produce and be creative and, and deliver deliver value, right? So, so uh, Constantinos correctly said that it's like an art form, you know, the valuation, but usually you start with some number which might be reasonable for the funding ask that is on the table, right? So if you, issue, if you ask, let's say, for 200,000 euros, let's say a very early stage, right? Uh, you know, the valuation cannot be 300 because, you know, they'll, be, they'll take all of the company, right? Uh, so so the, the rationale of, you know, fair allocation, you know, dominate. So you'll see something that would, you know, make the 200K be closer to like 20%, for example. And again, you know, these are arbitrary numbers, but these are the ballparks that somebody should expect. If somebody comes and asks for half of the company, you know, to, 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 to get started, I'll be very suspicious. Because that, if you start from that percentage as a founder, I mean, the whole founding team, less than 50%, let's say, okay, there is not, you know, a room a lot of room for dilution further down the road, okay? Sometimes, if I may add, uh, by having not uh, much of your experience, of course, is that uh, in these cases, uh, you prefer to to act towards uh, introducing some other elements and suggest some other uh, tools of financing, for example, debt to equity. You know, so in terms, you guys, you know, come up with a yes. proof of concept with a serious proposal, or at least with right. uh, an appraisal that uh, you don't know now, huh? right. but you will expect. Huh? Excellent point, uh, Panagioti. And I think we should mention, especially if we have early stage entrepreneurs here, the concept of a safe, which is, is, a, is a, you know, similar term for future equity. So basically, it's a piece of paper where you can very easily get money from an investor without going through the process of determining the valuation, right? So you take the account down the road exactly because it's too early to tell. So somebody believes in you, they'll give you the money, you sign this, and when you have your first round, things will settle and that person will, will get the corresponding equity, typically with some discount, right? So it will be cheaper for them to buy the shares exactly because they got in early, right? So so look it up, you know, the safe, because I think it's one of the best ways for somebody to get started before even talking to VCs, okay? A VC would not do a save, right? But angel investors will, okay? Uh, and that's, you know, it's great because again, you avoid both the legal paperwork, uh, but also the, uh, but also the, 
uh, the question of evaluation. Okay. Okay, great. I think we need to start wrapping up because it's been it's been more than an hour, but I think it was very helpful and, and insightful for all the participants. I would like to thank very much our presenters. It was great having you here, and uh, we're you. gonna meet most. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna meet most of you um, on the 24th, as uh, Mr. Kalagirai said that we have the the pitching event for some companies. I would like to remind again to all the participants to join our Inagora community. I'm gonna send the link again, and uh, we have a lot of events coming up that are gonna be equally interesting, and um, you can you can benefit a lot from the platform. Mr. Kalagirakis, would you like to? Say goodbye. No, or? It was very complimentary. All the yeah, everything that we have great. heard, the, it was uh, amazing, uh, amazing uh, tips uh, from all of you. Thank you all. And uh, definitely, there is uh, there is a momentum. We we've seen what happens uh, in the past uh, couple of years, and uh, we will uh, all all uh, uh, you know support this. Uh, and as the HDB, we will support this trajectory that uh, we've seen. And uh, we are happy to to join this system. And right. uh, yeah. So thank you all. We'll we'll Thanks. we have uh, the recording and we will uh, send it. And maybe we'll send some of the tips, the presentations that uh, you kindly shared. Maybe we can send them uh, to the to the participants if you agree, along with the recording. Okay. Right. Sure. So. Um, so yeah, see you at the next uh, event. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.